so it turns out that the issues we're grappling with are more complex, meaning they have more component parts to them, right? Um, there's, they're interdependent so that you, you can't really solve one without worrying about the other at the same time. So they're systems based in a way, right? Um, uh, they're more ambiguous. And so it's, it, it, it's harder to know whether or not what you're about to do is the right answer because in a lot of cases, we're dealing with something we've never dealt with before, right? So we've never tried to take CO2 equivalents out of our value chain, right? We, we, um, we have dealt with pandemics before, but not in your lifetime, right? We, in, in the kind we have. And so these are things that are coming up where actually we just don't know the answer. And so we're, we're making our best guess, but doing nothing is prohibitively expensive, right? Um, and then um, there are circumstances where there are many more constituents to the issues we're trying to solve. So it used to be the case that within PwC, for example, we had to worry about the regulator and our clients. Well, actually we have to worry about the general public. We have to worry about politicians. We have to worry about a whole series of regulators that aren't in our traditional kind of financial services area. And so consequence is the leadership challenge is radically different. And therefore the kind of leader we need is also radically different. The key piece to it at the heart of the argument is that um, you have to be able to do things that feel mutually contradictory, right? Um, and because of that, typically people are good at one side of it and not at the other because we tend to do the things we like and know well, um, but you gotta be good at both. So let's start with localists first, by the way, and then come back to global demand, right? Because I think there's an important piece here, which is, if you think about some of the things that the world's not doing very well, right? So disparity in wealth is a huge issue around the world, um, both across regions and within regions, right? Um, and across generations. Another thing is not doing well, we're not doing all that good a job of sort of allowing small business to thrive and COVID's made it worse, right? Um, we're not addressing climate. Um, we aren't addressing the unintended consequences of technology. And so what you're seeing is that regional disparity is accelerating at a faster rate than individual and even intergenerational disparity is. So, so the, the problem we're gonna have is that the world will be composed of very, very, very successful locations with massive amounts of wealth in those locations and the rest of the world in some real challenge, both within countries and between countries. And, and, and turns out the problem with that is, let me give you an analogy. Imagine we had an Olympics where there was only two athletes who actually ever qualified to compete. It'd be pretty boring. We're kind of getting there in the world of the economy, right? Which is there are fewer and fewer places being massively successful. So what we have to do is have an ethos, and this is particularly true in the world you live in, Jeffrey, which is we have to have an ethos that says, Every village needs to thrive. Every community needs to thrive. Every town needs to thrive. And then we build a global connectivity on thriving local communities. So the key piece in the story is you've got to be focused on building thriving local economies first and then globalize, right? So, so the danger is if you think about technology as a way to allow you to connect to the world, and it allows you to be a player in wealth creation, the risk is that you succeed and don't bring the rest of your community with you. So two pieces of advice for people building businesses in the world today with, in an interconnected world. First one is um, remember where you come from, love a place and take care of it. And the second is realize that actually there are many things in which we're interconnected and there's a lot of capability in places other than your own you can bring to bear on the challenges you have in your own local community. So it is a case of globally minded localists where what we used to teach when I was in business school is a locally aware globalist. We've actually flipped the need in a very important way. So let me give you an example related to, um, so everyone, if you would on the call, think about the person you felt managed COVID brilliantly. Just have a name in mind and a face, have a person in mind, get one, okay? Now, I bet two things about that person. Here's the first one, that they were humble enough to know they didn't know enough about COVID to take a decision while getting massive amounts of input. 
they, they talk to a, a um, epidemiologists, they talk about big health officials, they talk to business leaders, they talk to leaders of civil society, they talk to politicians, they probably talk to the average citizen, and they even likely talk to psychologists about what's going to persuade people and not persuade people, right? And when they got there, I promise you, they had no idea what the right answer was because there wasn't a right answer, right? There were, there were choices that seemed better or worse, but there was no obvious right answer. And so they were humble enough to seek the input, but courageous enough to take a decision in times of serious ambiguity, right? That, um, now ask yourself, how many people are humble and heroic in the same person? Stories of hero heroism don't tend to have humility at the heart of them. And one of the problems with people are, who are kind of inclusive and humble is that they, they, they can never get off and take a decision because the next, the last person in the room was the one they listened to, right? So, so the issue is uh, they had the courage and then they had humility to realize that they were probably wrong. The challenge is when they took the decision, because it was ambiguous, they were going to be massively criticized. Every single person who took a decision in COVID at any point in time has been massively criticized. And, but they were heroic enough to take the decision anyway, knowing that inaction was worse than an imperfect decision and that the criticism came with a job, right? And then they were humble enough to understand they were wrong and change it. So that's attribute one, humble hero. Attribute two is that they were technically very sophisticated. They, they could understand the math behind epidemiology. They can understand the, the various kinds of, of uh, vaccines and what works and doesn't work. They can understand kind of the public health questions. And so they were technologists, right? But, but they also understood what made human systems work and people work. So what, what happened is they, they knew what kind of was the right thing to do, but they knew how to make it work in their societies or their businesses. The challenge is that many people are really good at people, right? But terrible at technology are really good at technology don't understand human systems. Ask yourself, how many people have an electrical engineering degree or a PhD in biology and also studied psychology, sociology, and political science? And how many people who studied the humanities actually are good at technology? We needed people who are both and the best leaders are both. So I actually never thought of myself as a leader, by the way. I mean, I get asked the question a lot, what makes you a good leader, right? And, and, and they would say, well, your track record shows you are. I never thought of myself as a leader. Um, and, and part of the reason is, uh, that's important is, the danger in talking about leadership is it's an egocentric exercise if we do it wrong, right? And good leaders aren't egocentric. Um, so to me, I think the important point, if I were to look back over my own career is, I just saw the next obvious problem and figured out what to do with it. And I cared deeply about the people who worked with me and for me. Um, and, and so to me, if you go back and say, what are the things if I reflect on when I was at my best, it was, there was a thing that needed to get done and I found a way to get it done. And, um, and I cared deeply about the people. So what I wanted was for them to be the best version of themselves on their terms, not mine, right? Um, and now the, the point to that is that those two features, if you do them right, actually help you be good at the paradoxes, right? So, so they're, they're not separate, they're related. So first of all, you have an incredible luxury, which is you know each other. Right? Um, and so if you can create a kind of shared view of the world you're trying to create, however imperfect that shared view is, and you act independently, then we'll actually see the world start to go there, right? Um, and so stay connected to each other and, and debate each other and build ideas. Second answer is find a place you love and make it better. Um, now it turns out, the reason I trust that to create a coordinated answer is that almost every place in the world is sharing the same problems. We call them different things. They have different form, right? So um, the form of distrust in institutions in Europe and in, in Germany is different from the United States, is different from South Africa, is different from India. We still have it, right? The issue of small business succeeding is a different problem, but we still have it, right? The, the way it's climate plays out is different. We still have it. The lack of inclusiveness is different, but we still have it. So if we actually find a place we love and make it better, then actually the world in aggregate will do well, right? Um, and then I think my third piece of advice is um, dream big. 
the world needs serious action on really serious issues. And what's kind of cool about that, so the, the last thought if I can, um, I'm going to be a business dean for a minute. For the first time in a long, 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 long time, what's in the interest of the shareholder is also in the interest of general society. Because the issues that I, I described in the book and we talked about are here and they're urgent. So they're material for every business in the world. Uh, therefore, if you, if you take on a thing and make it better with those in mind, in aggregate, the world will get better, but we got to do it big and we got to do it fast because seriously, the reason we wrote the book is the three crises in particular, we've got a decade or the world goes really dark. So get to it, I think I would say.